Welcome everybody. This is um, the Bonner History Roundtable and I'm proud to announce this is our 15th roundtable. We do three of these a year so it's hard to believe but we've been doing them for five years now and I want to uh, welcome all of you. Some of you are familiar faces, some are new. I think this is going to be a super program today. It's our last program for um, 2013. We'll all be out gardening or something by next month at this time I hope. Uh, before uh, we uh, start the program, I have a few uh, thank yous to do to wrap up this year. Uh, many individuals support the Bonner Milton History Center, and hopefully uh, we recognize you individually. So I'm not going to try to do that today because the list would be very long. Um, the Bonner Milton History Center and history of the area is really precious to people out here, and I think you can see, uh, you'll be able to see that numbers of people that um, enjoy our historic interpretation from the list of community organizations which and state and local organizations which uh, actually help support us in many different ways. Um, I'm doing this in alphabetical order. Uh, the Bonner Milltown Community Council, Bonner Property v Development uh, LLC, that's Mike Baim and Steve Nelson, who I should tell you uh, give us our home at the, in the Bonner Post Office free of charge. So if you are able to come and visit the um, Bonner Milltown History Center, we're there because of them. Uh, Bonner School, Friends of Two Rivers, Hellgate Lions, Historical Museum at Fort Missoula, the Milltown Redevelopment Working Group, MCAT, who always films our um, programs, that's Missoula Community Access Television. Missoula County has given us several Preserving Missoula County History grants. We have had uh, support from the Montana History Foundation, from the Northwestern Energy Community Grant Program, Our Saviors Lutheran Church, the River City Grill, and St. Anne Catholic Church. I'd also like to mention the names of our committee members uh, who um, actually is a great organization. And if you're looking for something to get involved with, I suggest our group because you come and tell stories and listen to stories and you can do a project on something that interests you if you want to. So it doesn't get better than that. Uh, our committee, Willie Bateman, Lee Legrid, Judy Matson, Dennis and Anna Sane, Miney Smith, Glenn Max, the hooligan, Smith, and his wife, Sharon, and Jim Willis. I hope you'll join us. If you want to join our committee, uh, show up the first Thursday of each, any month of the year at 2 o'clock at the History Center. That's when we meet. And uh, otherwise, just come and visit the center. Our hours are Tuesday mornings from 9.30 to 11.30. And Jim Willis brings really good treats, so you'll have great conversation and great goodies. That's 9.30 to 11.30 Tuesday mornings. And then Wednesday and Thursday afternoons were open from 2 until 4.30 in the afternoon. So now we'll go, go right on into our program. Well, first, are, are there any announcements of other history-related items? that I know Kim's going to talk about the Mullen program, which is coming up uh, in addition to his. Okay. Kim Brigham's family moved to the area in the 1950s, and Kim's history interests have grown deep roots in the many stories and historical aspects of our area. While covering the 2009 Mullen Conference for the Missoulian, Kim became fascinated with the stories of the Mullen Expedition, many of which occurred right here or nearby here. Kim will be joined in his presentation by Dennis Sane, Tom Ewell, and others. Kim?
Yeah, I think it'd be better if we had the lights down. Um, thank you, Judy. Um, Judy may have for forgot to introduce herself, Judy Matson, who's kind of the motor that that <laughs> runs runs this and has been for <laughs> a number of years. Um, I I come come be come before you today not certainly as a as an expert on the Mullen Road, and in fact I'm hoping that what this turns into more of me telling you uh, is a little bit of a workshop area where you're telling me some things because the Mullen Road, um, the more you get into it, and it's like this with any number of historical topics, um, the, more you, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And um, I don't know I don't know anything compared to some of the, some of the people in the crowd here, so it's it's sort of intimidating. <laughs> but I have um, I, I would like to share some of the cool things that I've found as the Mullen Road applies to this area itself, and by this area I mean um, the confluence of the rivers and um, the few the 30 or so miles up the river, up the. Clark Fork River to Medicine Tree Hill, which is a significant um, mile post or a significant place on the Mullen, Mullen Road and uh, in, in Western Montana history. We'll get into that later. Um, the, there, there are a couple of unpaid advertisements I would like to do. The Mullen Road, um, I don't know if it's having a resurgence of interest, but there are a lot of things or some things going on right now um, region-wide in the Northwest that uh, are, are calling the Mullen Road to, or, to people's attention. One of them is, is uh, happening just next week. Um, the universe or the history club in town that meets at the university on the last Friday of each month is having a guest speaker on the Mullen Road by the name of Will Bill Weichel, who is kind of kind of at least my guru <laughs> in terms of Mullen Road uh, uh, information and so forth. Bill is with us today. He brought some of his uh, historic surveying. Uh, equipment that was used, actually the type that was used on, on construction of the Mullen Road. Can everybody hear me? Because I'm not used to this. A little louder. Should I start over? <laughs> no. I got to consult my notes. Um, most of you know what the Mullen Road is all about. Um, Lieutenant John Mullen at the time was um, in charge of basically two sweeps um, from Fort Walla Walla in Washington to Fort Benton, uh, building the first road through the Northern Rockies, the first engineered road through the Northern Rockies. The idea was to, um, I guess the, the, the idea that they sold it to Congress at least was to be able to move troops to the northwest from the headwaters or the highest navigable point on the Missouri to the ha highest navigable point on the Columbia and connect those two points. 1859 through 1860 was his first sweep starting from Walla Walla uh, to Fort Benton and the second sweep was 1861 to 1862. Um, the first winter they spent at Cantonment Jordan, which was up by De Borgia. It's about a mile on this side of De Borgia on the St. Regis River. They had hoped to make it to St. Regis at least. Um, before winter set in, they didn't make it. The second winter um, they spent right here. Cantonment Wright was, um, to me, one of the, one of the history, Histor historical um, points in the whole construction of the Mullen Road. They spent, um, Mullen and his men spent a full six months camped um, on, the, on the banks of the Blackfoot. Um, the, the road itself was not used by the military more than, more than once really to move troops and uh, that was right off the bat in 1860 
um, but it's given credit and probably is due credit for, for the settlement of what became Montana in just a few short years because um, it opened up the route to the, go to the gold mines when, when gold was found, especially down in, in uh, Ban Bannock and, and Alder Gulch. So um, I, I, the other thing that I strikes me before we really get going here is that um, these history roundtables that have been going on for, for five years or so, um, the Mullen saga seems to, if not encapsulate a lot of the things that we've talked about here over the last five years, but um, at least it was kind of the first. When you look at, uh, I think it was our January round table, the subject was military and veterans. Well, mil the first military, sustained military presence in in this area was right on the banks of the Blackfoot at Kentonement Wright for six months. Um, you talk about the, um, last week we talked about, or last month we talked about the railroads. And of course that was probably the driving force for the construction of the Mullen Road. Mullen had been here before. He was here first in 1853 uh, on Isaac Stevens Railroad Survey, one of five surveys that they were doing to put in a transcontinental railroad. Um, and Mullen's last appearance in this country was in 1883 when they when they drove the golden s or the final spike at uh, Independence Creek up at Gold Creek. He came from his lo lawyer his his law career in Washington D.C. to be part of that that last spike ceremony because it was a fulfillment of the dream that he had all all along before he, he before he began construction of the um, of the Mullen Road to uh, see railroads and see trains going through this country. That said, that was my introduction. <laughs> I, I thought it'd be kind of fun to take a quick, very quick virtual tour of roughly the Mullen Road from Missoula to the top of Mullen Pass. And I say roughly, um, <laughs> very advisedly, there uh, a lot of the lot of this is um, accessible. I mean, you, it's stuff that you can drive and study and and determine on your own. Well, the road must have gone here. The road must have gone there. Nobody really knows for sure. Um, m a lot of us have our ideas of s certain stretches, but the road, the Mullen Road, that was constructed in between 1850, well, here 1860 and 1860. Two, um, just followed the Clark Fork River. Um, back then, it was called the Hellgate, and um, so let's let's jump into that. A lot of it, that's a recognizable point. Uh, we're starting on Front Street, even though there's evidence that probably the Mul the first Mullen Road did not go down Front Street. Um, it may have gone between what that Maine and Broadway, Mr. Weichel. <laughs> so why why not start in the alley behind the parking garage? <laughs> may have crossed the rattlesnake around where where Front Street crosses it today. On a, on out of town on on again very roughly Highway 10. Getting to East Missoula. Um, there is uh, evidence that the, the road itself, the original road, went along the south side of East Missoula and then on out towards Marshall Grade. Um, the, the Marshall Grade was for years and decades a, a big barrier to travel for between Missoula and Bonner, etc went over the top and there's Marshall Grade looking towards the other side. There's a cool postcard, I think Dusty has, has one as well, um, of looking down Marshall Canyon um, back in around the 1900, I think, and uh, the, r the road off to your right, which is obviously not, not a road anymore, 
um, was probably the the pathway over Marshall Grade. This is this I took yesterday or the day before, whenever this snow was. So that's that's the river, and you're at at the bottom of Marshall Canyon Road. You're looking out sort of towards Canyon uh, Canyon River Golf Course, etc. Moving into Milltown, here's here's our kiosk um, of the of the Mullen that statue that used to be down closer to the confluence of the river before the interstate came through. There's old John himself, looking a little bit worse for the wear. These statues were um, put in all along the road um, in Idaho and Montana um, in about 1916, I think, Jim? <laughs> Somewhere around there. At least the Montana ones were. We'll run into a couple more on the road here. Uh, following out towards Piltsville. And as we get past Tura, um, you, you see the ridge coming down on the left-hand side there. Um, that was a significant ridge because the river, as again, as we'll see later on with Tom, Tom Ewell's presentation, the river went right up against that ridge and they had to figure out a way either to cross the river there or or to go up on the mountainside. Their option was to go up on the mountainside that you can sort of see the uh, the road up here. It's called Three Mile Hill, Three Mile Grade, um, built in the spring of 1862. And that's a view from, I think from the interstate. You go by it all, I went by it how many thousands of times and just just learned thanks to to Dennis Sane and Tom Yule that that was the Mullen Road out by Clinton they're still calling it the East Mullen Road people probably here live live on that road um, probably went out you know in the area of of the old Mullen Road or, or the the Mullen Road uh, through Clinton. Uh, as we get closer, uh, another significant ridge that can't comes down um, before you get to Rock Creek is what Mullen referred to as Rocky Point. There's a closer view of winter time, and and we're getting to Rocky Point there. And this is um, Rocky Point with uh, f looking looking to the west. We're we're at the Rock. Crick Interchange, and um, he spent a lot of time the winter of 1861-62, his men did, cutting um, a, a road through uh, Rocky Point. By the way, some of this stuff may not be true. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I'm, I'm expecting people to point it out <laughs> when we get done with our tour here. <laughs> Uh, heading up towards Beaver Tail Hill in the background there, and there was is what might be some remnants. Of, at least it it is remnants of an old road on the backside of Beaver Tail Hill, coming down towards the pond. We're looking at the Weston Ranch, um, just west or just east of Beaver Tail Hill. My thought is that the road probably went up up and um, through that ridge to get down into Ryan, Ryan Creek, if you look at the terrain there. There's the Ryan Creek Meadows. And now this is, it was getting dark here when I took this picture, but um, we're coming up on Medicine Tree Hill. And what you can't see very well here is there's a slight rise right in here and that is, is the site, at least I'm convinced, of one of the historic bridges on the on the whole Mullen Road expedition. And that's actually on the other side of the river looking back across. And it, again, you can see that bridge approach. Um, and we'll talk more about that later on. Um, it was known, it became known in the 1860s, 70s as McCarty's Bridge. Um, I guess it's worth saying right now that when Mullen built the road, uh, the final version of the road, he kept it on the north side of the river 
all the way from St. Regis all the way up to this point here at Medicine Tree Hill and then across the river and stayed on on that side of the river for the basically for the rest of the way until it crossed again up in the Deer Lodge Valley. This is a bootleg shot here. Um, th this is for, um, not a place where you, I'm trying to keep these all where you can actually drive to and get, but um, this is from Medis the top of Medicine Tree Hill looking to the east, just to give you an idea of what's where, where we're at here. The Medicine Tree Hill basically is right across um, from those n the Nimrod hot, sp hot springs that you see people um, if you look if you're looking straight across from those hot springs that's the north end of Medicine Tree Hill the saddle where the pe people crossed actually there were at one time Mullen referred to it as four crossings hill a big broad long saddle probably half a mile wide um, is is well we'll get into that later <laughs> On the south side of the river, the uh, the road kept close to the the river um, in the, in the river valley essentially until we get get to the Bear Mouth rest area, and it took to the hills after that. This is uh, Antelope Creek, I believe, and there is a, a public road that you can follow through. Um, through the John Long Mountains and come down at uh, at, Fli at the Flint Creek Valley, uh, south of Drummond. This view of that road, still some cool old looking buildings on the road. You get into the narrow part and it does sometimes get rough. <laughs> Ferdinand might greet you. <laughs> And as we get to the, to the towards the top, the the radar um, towers there that overlook uh, basically the Drummond Airport. And this is actually coming down, looking back the way we came. But I thought this si this sign could have been posted all up and down the Mullen Road, all 624 miles of the Mullen Road, in stretches. No regular maintenance. Travel at your own risk. The maintenance after he built the road was a was a big issue a huge issue and now we're dropping down into the flint creek valley um it comes down uh at new chicago does that ring a bell for everybody new chicago um this building actually was um a, as i understand it was a s part of the stage station at new chicago still remains the new owner uh, New owners have re-roofed it, and there's probably people in here that know a lot more about it than I do, but it was Lucy Coberly's uh, stage station um, on, on the Mullen Road. That's that's the end view of the same Coberly's state hotel, I think it was. Is that? And uh, again, we're looking back the way we came towards um, towards the Flint or the uh, John Long Mountains. And now we're heading up towards the new Chicago Cemetery across Flint Creek and there's the road going up to the, towards the cemetery. Um, lots of historic branches and so forth there in the in the bottom um, between Hall and Drummond. Eventually the road starts to peter out. <laughs> you get into an alfalfa field um, and um, a couple miles, well, actually, if you're, if you're looking back, we're, you're looking back towards Drummond in this shot. Drummond is on the other side of the river, of course, and uh, we're in the hayfield. You can't go all the way through. Eventually, there, there's a fence that, that stops you. Um, and maybe you shouldn't be there in the first place. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know who owns that. So you backtrack through Drummond, come back around down the Flint Creek Valley to Drummond, and of course there's John again. Um, there's issues. This says Captain John Mullen Trail, 1853 to 1855. 
I don't know who or why they came up with 1853 to 1855. Mullen built a road, not a trail, and he did it between 1859 and 62. <laughs> Um, he was here in 1853 uh, on that railroad survey. We get, um, this is it, the Jens exit. You start heading up towards um, Gold Creek in that area. Um, I'm fuzzy with, with the route here, and, and there's people here that probably have a firmer idea. Um, uh, this is the old, but basically the old stagecoach road. My own, my dad grew up in this area, in the Jens area, and he always referred to it as the stagecoach road. And it gets rough. It's a county road, but it gets rough. Billy Wallace Ranch, maybe, maybe a lot of you, some of you know about that. This is, again, as you get up high, you're looking back down to the interstate towards Drummond. Um, I'm not convinced that the the Mullen Road, I don't think Mullen built his road this high. I think he, he turned it towards the river and kept it lower. Um, I, we, we've already got, now we've gone through Gold Creek and um, gone up, up the creek a couple of miles um, and crossed Gold Creek. And uh, now we're heading for Deer Lodge, but we're heading through the deer, to Deer Lodge up in the mountains away from the river. The river was not a place he wanted to run his road because he wanted it to be an all-season road. And it, again, it gets rough. That may be out of place. I think that's before we get to Gold Creek. Um, this is a pirated shot from the internet. Can't make a dream. The road probably went right through there. And again, Jen, or uh, Gold Creek, um, another pirated slide here. Um, one of the few Milwaukee uh, power stage substations existing uh, on the road. Now we're up in the mountains behind um, Deer Lodge. If, you've, if you know of uh, Rock Creek Lake, um, what is that west of Deer Lodge? Um, this is Rock. This is that Rock Creek, and uh, eventually we'll we'll come down to the Rock Creek Cattle Company outside of Deer Lodge. You're going on up top, and um, when you get to what they still call Mullen Gulch, which is basically um, Gary <laughs> Gary Tavner. Who grew up in this area? Um, the the former um, Williams Polly Ranch, and the where are you, Gary? Oh, there you go. <laughs> and, and and then it was the Tavner Ranch, and now it's the Rock Creek Cattle Company Ranch. Am I pretty close here? Um, they've got a lock gate, so you can't follow the the original Mullen Road down Mullen Gulch unless you know the code. So you keep on going down uh, into Deer Lodge, and uh, <laughs> that's Dora, ex Dora the Explorer at the feet of John. <laughs> that's a story that I won't get into. <laughs> um, then we come back and go back up Mullen Gulch at the Rock Creek Cattle Company, um, what, four or five miles north of Deer Lodge, I think, somewhere in that area. And that's where the, that's the same road where it crosses the Clark Fork River. Well, now we're looking towards basically the spotted dog country, which, uh, and all this is, this is a study area for the Mullen Road people that, uh, I, it's a, a rich area um, of travel that we're going to now go through those hills, or try to at least. Um, actually, Back here, if you look at these trees here by the Quonset hut, um, that that's kind of, a f uh, in my mind, it shows you where the where the original road went, and this is the house that's at in those trees right now, very cool looking house. I don't know much about it. I think Gary probably <laughs> knows more than I do, and other people here. 
Um, that's in the, that's just behind the house as we head now up into the hills. And again, that's the first leg. That may not be the road, obviously, but that's the direction we're going up into the up into the spotted dog, dog country. You get up there, and one of the great things, I think, for the Mullen Road lately, in 2010, I think the state established the spotted dog wildlife management area in the hills between Deer Lodge and um, Avon. And the Mullen, that's right where the Mullen Road went. I don't think there's public access, actually, to, where, uh, to a lot of where the road went, but you can get, get near it. And um, there's a corral up there um, in one of these folds there that uh, obviously was used for years and years and years for everything from cattle to sheep to horses. And there, there you are up on top looking down at Deer Lodge. But you can't go all the way through. Um, p public access um, does not allow you through, so you take the detour get back down onto the uh, highway and go through Garrison and then up to Avon where this cool bird's eye mercantile is still in operation built in 1877. This wasn't part of the Mullen Road, but it's cool. <laughs> and just to orient yourself, that's that's the bridge out of, Orient, uh, out of Avon um, back up towards the spotted dog country. And there, that's just a picture of um, when you get up there a ways. It does allow you, um, uh, the, the new wildlife management area does allow you to get into a lot of that country that you might not have got into before. So um, once, you, once the road got down past Avon up through Illiston, um, then we start up, up the pass. There's the marker. From this point west to the Idaho line, the U.S. Highway 12 and I-90 follows the route of the military road located and con constructed in Montana between 1859 and 62 by a captain, actually was lieutenant until he got done with it, John Mullen. That's a pretty fuzzy picture, but that's one of the sites along that road as you're going up, heading up the pass. And this is where the the Mo the road to Mullen Pass turns off the the highway, um, and it follows the railroad. The railroad followed um, Mullen's Mullen's road, essentially up now Dog Creek. At one time they were both called Spotted Dog was called Dog Creek. My dad n always referred to it as Dog Creek, but this is another Dog Creek within a few miles of it. So. I think back in about 1930, they they petitioned to rename Sp uh, Spotted Dog Creek. Following the railroad today up there, this is at Blossburg at the end of the tunnel that goes, the Mullen Tunnel that uh, the railroad goes through. A lot of work going on at that time. Then we're almost up to the top. There we go. This is the the crest of the Mullen Pass. The and we've. <laughs> I know that people are have tried to f identify where the actual road crossed Mullen Pass. It's probably not where the today's road does cross. But one of the highlights when you get up to the top is the site of the first Masonic meeting in 1862. They've obviously reconstructed the site because I don't think there were the, uh, enough people at that meeting to fill all those benches. And that's the monument looking down towards the Helena, Helena side of the pass. And then back on the road, it's not always, it's not always passable. So that's our tour. And then w w before we go back down to here, do do we have any any comments <laughs> or stories, or do you want to call my bluff? <laughs> <laughs> what did they use for bridges? I mean, just made of timbers and sunk them in, or? Well, the, um, we'll get into the building of the bridge here at the Blackfoot. Um, and again, I I'm not an expert on that. Um, I do I do have the description that Mullen used here. 
But going back to my point that we're revisiting a lot of the topics that these roundtables have talked about, um, basically building that bridge and the, the log huts for the winter were the first logging operation in, in Bonner. Um, Anything? Yeah. The Three Mile by Tour, Tura and Rocky Point, are they open to the public for hiking? Uh, probably not. They are on private ground, um, but we do have an expert in that field here to talk to us specifically about that in a, in a little bit here. Um. Yeah. At Rock Point, that was right across from Rock Creek Confluence, right? Right. Uh, and you said they spent the winter of 62? 61, 62, they spent it here at Milltown. Okay. I just wonder, that's public land now across the uh, river, and I just wondered whether there was any encampment or anything there that would, should be called to their attention. Um, it's on the north side of the river was was where the camps uh, actually there were two in that vicinity and and I uh, will we'll go through that here in a little bit too I I'm going back now and kind of tracing or s sticking close to home um, and we'll talk about Rocky Point and Three Mile Hill yeah you I'm a little bit clarity question on the pass itself you said the, the road sign says the highway goes up the trail, and then you said the rail goes up the, the Mullins Trail. Well, when they put the Mullin in the 1883, when the NP built its railroad, they chose the same pass that that Mullen had chosen, um, well, essentially thir 30 years earlier. Um, so uh, the the there's a lot of things that follow the old Mullen Road beyond just uh, the highways and the railroads too, and we'll see evidence of that when we get back to to uh, Medicine Tree Hill. But, and I'm talking gas lines and power lines, and, and all. It's, a, it's a corridor. Judy? Um, just a point of, uh, would you repeat the questions and people ask them, because we can't always hear what they are. I will. Yes, and, and if, if anybody has beyond a question, but something, an assertion, I'd appreciate if, if you would stand up and uh, maybe kind of talk to the camera a little bit. <laughs> Not to scare anybody, but another question, Mr. Weichel. I think his question was regarding the sign that was on that's on the highway that says that that was where the Mullen Road went. You know, over to Days. I always get confused, Rogers or McDonald, whichever one it is. And no, it does not follow the, the Mullen Road. Did not follow today's highway over the mountains. It went to the north up that valley where the railroad goes now. No. I see. Excuse me. Anything else? Yes. Why was such a young officer picked by Governor Stevens to even undertake this very important task? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Bill? I, I, I think he, he proved himself more than anything. He came out as one of a number of officers in 1853 with the Stevens survey and by the time they got to this part of the country Stevens had basically determined that he was the one with the most capabilities to uh, to, to stay for a couple of winters in the Corvallis area and direct explorations throughout the mountains. Then he developed the passion along with Stevens to try to put a road through eventually. So they were the two that were lobbying Congress. And so by the time he was building the road, he wasn't, he was 30, which in those days, you know, 30 was, was, was good material for being in charge. And he was also a West Point graduate. Um, St I, Isaac Stevens, of course, was the, when they created Washington Territory in 1853, he was appointed the governor of Washington Territory and so they said, while well, you're on your way out to Olympia, you might as well survey the railroad routes. So, and he was happy to do it. <laughs> Mark, wasn't part of the trail marked by blazed trees, which then had initials on them, 
and people have misinterpreted what MT stood for? MR, right, yeah. MR stood for military road in Mullins, my, you're right. But um, it, it later became, very quickly became um, considered Mullen, Mullins Military Road. I mean, it, it, um, in the legal documents in 1869, it referred to Mullins Military Road. Um, but, but you're right, I think there were mile markers maybe every mile, is that, does that ring true? I, I, I don't know whether in the record whether it actually shows, but they did have mile markers at various points to where they, had, they used a combination of using trees and posts, and they put an MR with a mile number on it. Question. Kim, uh, whoever it was who spoke to us from over here mentioned uh, a couple of camps in Corvallis. And I'm wondering, I, I became aware that uh, an avial tinkum was, may have left one of those camps and headed north over Evero Hill along one side of Flathead Lake, heading for Marias Pass to survey that for a possible railroad route. <coughs> Does anybody know <coughs> anything about that? That's right. That is right. Left Cantonment Stevens. Is, Cantonment Stevens was the, the area that uh, Mullen established in 1853 to 1854 to, to work out of, to explore all the various passes to see which one would be the best for the railroad. And that's when he, that was during that exploration when he found out that Mullen's road for his money would be the best one. But um, I, I'm not sure about the, the tink, Tinkum. I've seen that name, but I don't know. Well, and you see it farther west. You see it in uh, Washington, uh, somewhere in the Cascades. Okay. Was it about that time, 1853? Yeah. Okay. Oh, he's part of the same survey. Okay. Back to Cantonment Wright. Um, <laughs> Mullen, Mullen referred to it as a cold and bleak place, and um, I think we would refer to it as the same thing if we'd plop down in the parking lot of Harold's Club in the winter of 1861-62. Um, this is a, probably a view that you you've may be familiar with. Um, basically, the confluence of the the uh, Blackfoot on the left and the Clark Fork or the Hellgate on the right. Um, this is, is a lithograph of a sketch that Gustav Sohan um, sketched that winter. There's the actual sketch. This is, I was, I was very excited to find this. Um, it came from the National Archives where um, uh, retired professor of history, I guess he is, Dan McDermott, who's sort of a, a guru for, um, for the national, national scene of the Mullen Road. Um, he dug this out and sent it to me last year. Um, and it's quite a bit different, of course, than the lithograph, which I, which I will get into. Um, there's roughly the same view from the overlook today, or whenever it was that snowy. So what you have here is, again, the sketch that Sohan did in probably April of, of 1862 um, with, and it's hard to see, but the, the bridge is sketched in there, right up there. And um, you can kind of get an idea of the river bottom better in the sketch of what it actually looked like before, of course, it was inundated by the dam in 1908. Um, it's interesting, um, a lot of these sketches that, that were, took place in the Stevens survey and, and uh, also the Mullen Road expedition were sent to lithographers, lithographers in, uh, in the east to make them, basically make them more palatable. And uh, so they, they did some tinkering with them and uh, added people out of all proportion to the countryside and uh, kind of changed, changed what our view 
or the eastern view of of this confluence that we're that we live on today um, actually looked like the lithographer that oh, I've lost it but <laughs> it's on the second page my notes um, the, the lithographer that did Sohan sketches for the Mullen report was probably one of the better known in, in the country at the time um, in Philadelphia Philadelphia he was the same his company was the same one that did um, John Audubon and his son's sketches that turned them into lithographers or lithographs. The problem as Dan Flores uh, the former UM professor points out in one of his really cool book I've got a copy of it here um, sometimes the lithographers weren't quite sure what they were looking at and so in this case um, the ones who did this is a John Stanley mix um, based on a John Stanley mix um, sketch in in the 1853-1854 um, railroad exploration and uh, he forgot the lithographer forgot to put in the river um, as it comes out of Missoula into Missoula Valley it's this particular one you can't probably read it very well is called Hellgate entrance to Tagot to Kadat Pass from the west, which kind of gives you an idea of what, how many of you know where Kadat Pass is today? <laughs> it was fairly, <laughs> a fairly important um, pass between Rogers Pass in the Blackfoot and Lewis and Clark Pass, the, the pass that Meriwether Lewis crossed in 1806. Kadat Pass was, was one of the main vehicles or main avenues across the mountains. Would anybody like to read that for me? <laughs> and this is where I got to... I don't have the right paper. Um, this is a page from Mullen's uh, day journal, his working journal. Um, and the... Uh, middle the the middle item there is as um, dated Wednesday November 20th 1861 this is when the day that Mullen actually got to con cantonment right um, he had sent uh, lieutenant Salem Marsh ahead with men t uh, to to get the camp built basically they built log huts and uh, get them ready for him as they came along and, and uh, were, I think in this case, he, um, he, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> he was uh, working on Marshall grade that day. And, and what this says, and I would read it for you if I had my, my right notes, just a second. <laughs> What this says is, men engaged in the morning in grading up the slope to gain a high elevation where the road had not been located, and having issued supplies for the next 10 days, moved forward to the cantonment at the Big Blackfoot, which we did not reach until late at night. Found that Lieutenant Marsh had made most excellent progress in his work and had his quarters nearly completed. That was on November 20th, 1861. They used cantonment right as their base of operations then for the next six months and abandoned it uh, on May 23rd of 1862. Now it's interesting to, to note we think of we think of that winter as being um, I don't know the the Mullen, Mullen men were out in a vacuum in the wild west in the frontier where uh, there was nothing nothing else out here no one else out here um, remember th this was the first winter of the Civil War these were uh, the least many of them were American 
um, belong to the our army. We're in the army. Um, if I can find it here. There, there were some signs of civilization at that time. Um, Fort Owen up the Bitterroot had been established for 10 years or more at that time, um, the trading post. Uh, the mission at what's now called St. Ignatius Mission um, was there, had been there for five years, the Jesuits. And um, for a couple years, the Stewart brothers and their colleagues had established the camp up at Gold Creek. And fortunately for us, they kept um, pretty good journals. And then one of the more important historic documents of Western Montana um, that Granville and James Stewart kept during that, during that time. And I went back through it and looked at um, the people that they mentioned were in the country in in those six months, essentially, that the camp that they were that Mullen was here at the cantonment, and you had um, I have a whole page full of them. Um, this is, was beyond, of course, the the tr various tribes that came through here. But um, in November, you had well mention of of Johnny Grant, Fred Burr, Jake Meek. Um, in December, before it got really cold. Thomas Adams, Stern Blake, John Powell, the man who Powell County and Mount Powell is named after. Were, these were all people that were in the camp at Gold Creek, not necessarily down here at, the, uh, at Canton Wright, but maybe. I mean, they were passing through to Hellgate. The, the town of Hellgate, obviously, I forgot about that, that was established uh, 11 miles west of here. Um, Bob Dempsey, who Dempsey Creek was named after, you get into into January and February when it was literally was probably the coldest winter on record, if you can cal call it on record. You hear that about a lot of winters, but um, there are there are if you Google eight, the winter of 1861-62, it was a bad winter, and and um, Mullen said as much in in his report and in his journals. Um, later on in March, you mention of Frank Warden and, Bar and Baron Barney O'Keefe, Frank Woody, all the folks around the Hellgate area that eventually ended up um, at some time or another up at Gold Creek. And in April, um, Christopher Higgins, the founder along with Frank Warden of, of Hellgate and eventually Missoula was up pan and gold up at Gold Creek, as was Edwin Dukes. By May, you had um, David Patty was mentioned in the journals, Patty Canyon, um, and also a, a Sam Hugo, who was probably not, doesn't ring a bell, but he was actually the man who um, Mullen commissioned when he left the mountains to uh, to a replenish the bridge that he built across the Blackfoot um, because it got wiped out in the first flood, and B the um, the bridge that we we saw by Medicine Tree Hill. He turned that construction over to Sam Hugo, um, who was a, a miner, a citizen of the Deer Lodge Valley, as they were referred to. So. All right, do we have any more? Questions about cantonment, right? <laughs> I just got a, excuse me, a quick question on which gold creek are we talking about? The one at Twin Creeks or the one at? Yeah. Good question. The the one up by past Drummond, between Drummond and Garrison. the The road itself. I mean, there there were surveyors or there were explorers, I guess, that went up the Blackfoot to see if that would have been a better route, um, and. Eventually, they chose the Clark Fork or the Hellgate Valley. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that in that case, I was referring to uh, it was about 11 miles from Cantonment right into the the village of Hellgate, um, out on Mullen Road. Mullen Road. Go figure. <laughs> what do you make of uh, um, him saying that where the road had not been located? Is he deviating from the existing Indian Trail there? And what he says it hadn't been located. Where the road hadn't, 
the question was what what is he what probably did he mean when it said where we we're, were doing work on the grade where the road had not been located um, well I, I and I don't know for sure I'm thinking this is the second time through you know he came through they came through in 1860 we're now in 1861 late in 1861 and um, they're changing the route of the road that second time through in fact one of the big reasons he did the second sweep was to throw the road um, from Walla Walla around up to Spokane, whereas the first time he came through, um, he he pointed it more towards around to the west of of Coeur d'Alene Lake, and um, so they changed a signif significant portion of that first part of the road, and but the second major I think he wanted to do was to get to this country and avoid all the river crossings um, that that they ran into the first time through on the Clark Fork or on the Hill Gate. Okay, um, question. Do the two rivers still come together at the same point now as they did then or vice versa? Does anyone have that answer? The question is, do the, do the, is the confluence at the same point now as it was then? There's some interesting speculation about that. <laughs> um, Bill, do you mind, Bill Weichel, do you mind filling us in? There, there's not enough. Do I talk loud enough or do I gotta walk up there? Come on up here. The, I think this is an interesting, interesting thing. You know, it's hard to tell. You're trying to compare a, a sketch drawing with uh, today's world where you can go out and take a f uh, photograph, and so it's very difficult to tell for sure. My speculation is that when they put the dam in, they wanted to use that rock outcrop on the southerly side of the river as one of their anchors for the dam. And so I believe they may have put the confluence maybe uh, 500 feet or more to the east than it was originally uh, and some of what I look at I'll have looked at on that if you're all familiar with the area that has been filled in um, across the interstate from the town pump uh, there's an area that was filled in for years from Champion that used to be a, a very significant sway, swale down through there and that may have been the original channel but I think over the period that, that in order to build that dam, they wanted to anchor in that rock outcrop on the other side. This is just a very fuzzy picture from the Demons collection here in Bonner. It says Wilbur, what? I can't even read that. Lead, Leadman, Old Mullen Road was to his left. You see the dam in the background, and um, the Mullen Road was to his left. And there's a picture that some of you guys remember, recognize. Uh, before the interstate, um, Milltown, looking from probably an aerial view there. And there's a closer look, and this is about 1915, of what what you can see, what this shows, yes, is um, the road, the original road or the old road um, coming before the dam um, was built in 1908. There's a closer look at it. Um, the, the dam flooded the McCormick Ranch and this was known as McCormick Hill and we've got stories. Is Jim? <laughs> Jim, are you interested in tell, telling us what you remember of McCormick Hill? This is Jim Willis. Use that as a, uh, we use that as a sledding hill, and uh, we would chop uh, holes in the ice there and take buckets and ice that hill. And if the if the river was plain ice. We'd probably go to the dam, almost to the dam. 
<laughs> and of course, we weren't smart enough to leave a part on the, we iced the whole thing. And so when we walked up, we had to walk on the hillside there and decided to get up in there. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun on that. And Jim, you lived roughly in one, I mean, in this area, right? Okay. And it wasn't just a wintertime recreational place, right? Well, I don't remember using it too much for in the summer. Mike might not remember something. Not really. <laughs> I've heard some swimming expeditions, but... I went down there, but there used to be three channels along there. And like Jim was saying, uh, you, you started out in the first channel when the ice was about a quarter of an inch thick, and most of the time you fell in, and then it froze a little more on the second channel and the third channel, you know. But we used to skate from the Bonner Mill all the way up to the Duck Bridge, you know, if the ice was, and then back in those days, the ice was better in, in the last years, you know, really the ice wasn't very good, you know. Does anybody know why? They built an interstate there that narrowed it down. The interstate was the so By the time the interstate was in, from there on, there was very rarely ever any good ice. Did everybody hear that? The after the interstate was put in in the 60s, um, it changed it changed the river in that way. Um, there are stories in in our grassroots book about the Flying Thibodeau brothers, the hockey team that had a hockey. Um, Rink, and where where was that at? The where did they play hockey? East of or no, west of that trail, and uh, there was also that uh, statue, the Mullen statue, was across the river from the trail there, the uh, McCormick Hill, <coughs> and uh, you could never figure out why that was there, but because we didn't know it was the Mullen Trail at that time. You didn't know it. We just knew it was the McCormick Hill. <laughs> and of course, the, they, they did also cut ice just on the other side of that that uh, trail there, and they had uh, put it, you know, and then they had sell it to the bars in Missoula and in Milltown and wherever, and uh, they would they all had ice houses, and uh, then they would get sawdust from the mills and line the ice with the sawdust to keep it. Uh, from melting all summer. They they use sawdust to keep the. Yeah. Was that the mill itself that did that, or was it the railroad? Okay. Private organization. Okay. Jim, can you identify any churches amongst the bars in that picture? <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> now, if, now, if you go west of the bridge there. There was a, a Lutheran church across the bridge. We are talking about a lot of different ethnic groups in, like as in Butte, uh, in, in this general area. Yeah, I don't know if they would have each had their own church, but... Well, by 1915, when this picture was taken, um, both this church, the Catholic church, and the Lutheran church were in place um, where they are right now. And then, there, was it a... What, I, I didn't remember it being a Lutheran church on the other side. Church, but it wasn't. It was this building there at that time. Okay. Uh, on the basically at the west log yard. By the Black Bridge. Okay. This was the Black Bridge. <coughs> Again, that that's. I don't know how old that picture is and who's in it, but. Um, that's the original location of the monument and when they put it in in 1916-1917. It was moved, um, and I think it's been moved three times since since they they uh, put the dam in. Um, at one time it was, go, go ahead, Chuck. Is that the same one that was originally down at the NP Depot? Not at the NP Depot because that one's still there. This one was at, um, for a long time, it was just on the other side of East Missoula at uh, under the under the viaduct there and and then right yeah by the river and then um it's it was at the end of at the intersection of orange street and um front yeah and main i guess too at that point 
for a long time. They moved it back. Yeah, and and I think um, it was about eight or 1996, I'm guessing, that Bonner reclaimed that statue and moved it back where it, where it is today, on the other side of the uh, the bridge on the Milltown. It's as close as you can get it to where <laughs> the original Mullen Road was, given all the things that have happened since then. I wanted to read. Oops. We didn't need that. I, w I did want to read a little bit f uh, about about cantonment right that uh, Mullen ro wrote in his report. It kind of lays out what what they were doing here. Um, the camp was situated upon the high flat in the forks of the Blackfoot and Hellgate's River, Hell's Gate River, where timber was abundant and close but exposed to the bleak winds that at times came down the valley of the Blackfoot. It was found an abode of not over much comfort. All travel, uh, again he's talking to this bad winter of 1861-62, all travel with the Indians had been suspended during the winter, but as snow disappeared there were, there were once more on the move, they were once more on the move, some crossing the plains in quest of buffalo, while others were returning from the same point where they had passed the winter. One of the really interesting things on the Granville Stewart and James Stewart diaries is the passing of not only the white people that were new to the country, but the Indians that had been here for millennia. The, um, the latter be basically the, the ones coming back from the buffalo grounds um, brought amounts, brought accounts of the severity of the winter on the upper Yellowstone and Missouri rivers and of the loss of stock that nearly all the Indians had sustained. Um, if you Google 1861-62, you'll find out that it's um, in, in the winter, actually, in December and January of that year, the, the Sacramento Valley was underwater. It was the. It still is considered the worst um, flood flood year in in the Pacific Northwest and and in Northern California, um, according to Wikipedia. When Mullen got here to this point in November of of 1862. He had he had some very specific chores in mind. Now keep in mind, the winter that they'd spent in the mountains before, two winters earlier, up by St. Regis, up by De Borgia, were um, were not necessarily work months during that winter, which was a good thing because they were having problems. But he he, he had specific things in mind that he wanted to do when he got here, and first and foremost was to build the bridge across the Blackfoot. And if I can find my papers, it, what, what he said was basically, um, he kept a party down at, at the confluence to build the bridge, but he also sent four other parties, work parties, up the Hellgate, up the, up the Clark Fork, where they established winter camps as well and um, began making side cuts in the mountain so they, the road didn't have to go through the river. Some of them stuck, some of them didn't. Um, he said, each party was directed to build for itself log huts, and when these were completed, to begin work upon the road. I was sanguine that I would be able to w work during the winter months, except when the weather would should prove of marked severity, and in this I was not seriously disappointed. They got a lot of work done. It just wasn't, uh, sometimes in January they weren't able to. Um, he describes then the construction of the bridge. The stream had already become frozen at its edges when he got here in, in November, and, and he, sent, he basically sent everybody up into the woods, I mean the work crew, the first thing was to get the wood to build the bridge. And when all the timbers went, were cut, ha hauled, hewn, and ready to be put together, 
we threw a boom across the river, which here was 235 feet wide, six feet deep, and had a current of four miles an hour. By means of this boom, we dammed up the floating ice, which in a single night became sufficiently frozen to allow horses to cross. So they did have horses here to help them. A lot of it was done on hand sleds when the transporting, etc. Taking advantage of this ice, we cut a, an opening large enough to, build, to hold the piers and commence their construction, sinking them by means of, of rock placed on a bottom with which each was provided until they rested in the riverbed. They were leveled by making a profile of the bottom and adjusting blocks under the longer set of ties. So they dropped these wood, these log cribs to the bottom through the ice and then leveled them off by, um, by, by adjusting the rocks at the bottom of the cribs. And um, uh, I don't know how many bridges were built that way but um, we saw, we've seen ev evidence of these log cribs, not for bridge purposes, but up above the trestle on the other end of Bonner, um, were, were there for quite a while, or until just recently, um, were used, uh, I guess, as, as booms for the log drives, I think. Um, Rock for filling then was gathered from a bluff at the abutment side on the left bank, the left bank being the Milltown side across the river from Town Pump. And, um, and by means of hand sleds run over the ice to the piers, which were thus rapidly filled. Each was thus built and the entire framework and superstructure erected f before the ice was, bro was broken up. While this was being done, the whip sawyers were at work sawing out planks 17 feet long, three inches thick for its crossing. By the 1st of the March, we'd completed the entire bridge, which was 230 feet long and four spans. Let me back up. And Actually, that shows more than four spans, doesn't it? <laughs> so... And, and it's so, so vague here, but I don't think there's as many on here. I think you see three piers on the sketch, and that was more accurate. Three piers, four spans. So basically, that was his job here. Well, that was one of his jobs here when at Cantonment Wright. The next one, and... Um, And I, I'm going to ask for help on this one um, from from a couple of our our, our experts um, was to set up these winter camps that made the the mountain cuts. And I think this is real cool. And this is one of the things that I I would like to know a lot more about is these winter camps. There's not much chance of finding any remnants in Milltown of Cantonment Wright. I, I would you agree with that, everybody? But these these winter camps, wherever they were, um, there may be some rich archaeological diggings there because in all cases they did build log huts and, um, and were there for the six months um, living and freezing and, and working. Number one is probably the coolest one. It's Williamson Winter Camp. Um, we'll, we'll have Tom Yule come up and talk about this one. Um, east of Tura to Kendall Creek. Williamson, he named all these th basically after the people that were in charge of the camps. The Williamson Winter Camp was uh, a civilian who'd been in charge of the work crews um, all both sweeps through for um, for Mullen, his name was David Williamson, and um, when Mullen got done with his road building, he re he retired from the army and went back east to marry Rebecca Williamson, and as it turns out, Rebecca's brother was David Williamson, and we're pretty sure that his future brother-in-law was in charge of his his main work work crews. 
uh, from the civilian side. The Campbell Winter Camp, somewhere east on this side of Rocky Point, um, maybe maybe Starvation Creek on that area. The Clark Winter Camp was just on the other side of Rocky Point, which kind of gets you an indication of how big a project it was to to make that huge cut um, at Rock Creek to get a road, any kind of road around it. I'm guessing maybe the Rock Creek interchange area, but again, don't know. And the fourth one was the Lantern, Lannan Winter Camp, and, and this one is, is probably the biggest mystery for me. I mean, you can kind of get look at maps and see where these were, but um, it was somewhere west of Medicine Tree Hill, uh, maybe by maybe by Beavertail Hill um, in the Ryan Creek area. So um, can we take a break here for a little bit? <laughs> um, in, in maybe five minutes, um, we'll have Tom Ewell and Dennis Sane come up here and talk a little bit about um, Three Mile Hill. Okay, we're ready to resume here. Um, our next topic, we'll, we'll be looking at some of the points up the river, but especially concentrate on Three Mile Hill. The um, description, as Mullen put it on his map, actually a Gustav um, sketch that we'll see here shortly, was the, uh, the side, cut, side cut by which the first and second crossings of the Hellgate River are avoided. And um, from stories that you hear, the side cut, well, some might have preferred the river itself. Um, there were, in the original Mullen Road, the 1860 version, there were 10, or there were 11 crossings between Bonner and Medicine Tree Hill. Mullen set out to eliminate all but one of those crossings by building four different side cuts, um, or no, actually four camps, five different side cuts, totaling seven miles is what he figured. The one that he called Three Mile Hill was probably the most, well, important one just because the river that low um, at the first and second crossings was, and especially during flood time, was not um, very navigable. So. Let's throw the roads up on the mountainside. And as it turned out, I think in later years, the, the stagecoach rides you hear about that came down the canyon, a lot of times they talk about crossing the river. So these side cuts all weren't used, but I think this one was, was used high water or low water just because by then the river was too big to, to easily cross. This, uh, and we're going to get um, Tom Yule up here to talk about Three Mile Grade. Um, this is a, a cool sketch that we got, and, and Tom may want to talk about this as well. Um, got from Professor Dan McDermott from back east. He, he was combing through the um, National Archives, and he showed this a couple of years ago at the Missoula, or at the uh, Helena Mullen day's conference and when I saw that he, he said at the time I'd really like to know where this sketch actually was taken well thanks to thanks to Tom and Dennis they had taken me up on the three mile cut just a couple of weeks before and I said boy I know where that is I mean there, there was no question that that was that and um, here, here we are, east of Tura, looking clear back at Mount Jumbo in the background down the interstate. And when, when I showed him this picture, Professor McDermott, this picture, he got very, he got kind of excited, which is, it's kind of fun to excite old professors. <laughs> is Joe gone? Yeah. No. <laughs> well, it is to determine what, you know, what anything on the Mullen Road is, is McDermott for 15 years talked about that picture being 
way west of Alberton. He, he was sure there was a spot way west of Alberton that was that particular location. And, and it wasn't until he tripped on this at one of our conferences that he rec Kim recognized it. And so he's putting this in his book. <laughs> Tom, do you want to discuss this? Sure. And tell him your connection. Well, my connection goes back to before I was born. My father moved out here in 1948. And he got a job with uh, uh, Red, uh, working for Red Tucker at uh, Tucker Motors in town. And uh, well, before I do that, uh, well, I'll share this. I'm going to pass this around while it can be. Uh, these are two pictures that were taken. I received a, a friend of mine he called me up and said, I found this picture of Tura taken a long time ago. And uh, she so emailed it to me, and it was a postcard that was for sale on eBay. <laughs> and it just happened to say uh, uh, North, Northern Pacific Railroad between Tura and Clinton. And I looked at that, and I, there's no place that the river's against the, the hill. And then I started thinking back. Well, I ended up, it ended up this picture was taken about 200 yards east of my house. And I went up on the Mullen Trail site and took my own picture and a few years ago, and you can see the similarities. You can pass that around. But basically, uh, this is east of my house. My house is, is in a gulch that's right behind that tree in the middle. It, it's, if you drive down the interstate and see a big cinder block house sitting up in a gulch, that's me guilty as charged. My father moved in into this area, you know, like I say, in about 40, 1948. And he lived in the, uh, I grew up in the gulch west of where I live now, uh, at um, just about across, I'm just just about even with the Tura Bridge where it is today. And and my, uh, everybody said, well, that's the Mullen Trail that, that went by there. And it's, uh, the trail is significant to me because that's where my mother took me on my first walks when I was about three years old. And I have a, a great love of wildflowers. Some of you have seen some of my photographs of my wildflowers that I've taken. And that's where I learned all about my wildflowers is on the Mullen Trail. Uh, and then later on, uh, that's looking into Tura, uh, across from the... Uh, the old Wayside Park, we're above Wayside Park about 500 vertical feet. And uh, when my father first moved to town, and he worked for this uh, motor company before he uh, worked for Ano Weimer out here in Milltown, there was an old gentleman that lived that worked with him at the shop. His name was A.P. Brown, and the folks just called him Brownie. And Brownie lived up in the in the Rattlesnake area, and he was quite a few years older than my father at the time. And uh, he, we would come out and visit with us. Uh, we'd have Sunday dinner or something. And Brownie would start talking about driving the Mullen Trail with his Model A during Prohibition. <coughs> uh, Brownie uh, admitted that he, he ran his share of bootleg at the time. And he would run between Missoula and Butte. And he said, but he drive. He said there were still sections of that Mullen Trail where he still drove that with a Model A. And uh, so, uh, being a young lad and curious, I said, "Well, how long did it take you to drive to Butte, Brownie?" He'd say, "Well, about 15 hours if you were in a hurry." <laughs> and apparently, Brownie was usually in a hurry. <laughs> That's just one of the one of the stories that I'd heard growing up. But. Uh, when I acquired the property where I live now, um, it was quite a long story about getting that, that piece of ground. Um, it belonged to a, a person in New York that lived in New York State that my father had met. And at the time, I wanted to start raising my kids and wanted to move back into the area. Uh, we were able to acquire the property. And I had used to... I used to dream about this piece of ground when I was growing up. I used to walk over that cliff at Tura. Uh, we had a little trail that went over the top where the, the Mullen Trail was cut off by that cliff. Uh, and so you just had to, it was just a deer trail over the top. It's a little scary at times. And so uh, I would, um, 
go over to that ground and I would, even as young as 10 years old, I would dream about owning the place. So uh, my dream finally came true when I was, when I was about tw 24 years old. And uh, if you look at this map here, you'll notice that their engineers and their surveyors, you, you'll see topo lines, topographic lines in there. And I received this a copy of this via email, and the grade starts clear over there at, at Tura Creek, it's on the left, and then it ended over in Kendall Creek on the far right. And then in the encampment, there was some controversy as where the encampment was. Well, when I moved in, and when I'd come over as a little kid, I'd walk over this, this gulch in the middle, right there. I'd walk over there, and I would see little um, flat areas little cabin sites there was no uh, nothing left of the structure at all but there was there was about three of these little cabin sites and even an old apple tree that had grown up and somebody had tossed an old apple out and um, I had asked about well we just assumed that it was old prospectors because there are a few prospect holes but I think Willie Bateman made most of those prospect holes up there I don't sure but <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway uh, later on, I learned from this Dr. McDermott, and he, he found this in the archives, and what amazed me the most when I received this, is I'm kind of a map person, and uh, if any of you guys that chase elk, you're probably map persons too. Um, I decided to take my USGS new modern topo map, and it was uncanny how those lines match up. Those fellows that did those surveying were uncannily accurate in their measurements. And you can take a, a copy of this, and especially if you go to uh, your topo map, and if you have a printer, you can expand or blow up or make it small so that it matches the scale on the new maps. And those lines line up. It's just spooky how well they line up. So as my hat's off to those surveyors years ago that went through there and showed that. And because of that, the accuracy of those maps, it was determined that the, that camp, those little, those little dugout places, were actual uh, places where those cabins were. And they're uh, right across the creek from my house. And uh, if uh, I'm not going to advertise this, but I, I don't want to turn my place into a zoo. But if anybody wants to come up and see that, if my neighbors, then... Uh, want to see it, see it sometime and walk a section of that Mullen Trail, look over the valley. If you call me, I'm, 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 I'm pretty easy to get along with. And so, uh, but anyway, that's kind of the story, and I had no idea uh, the mystery was kind of solved for me by this emailing, and I was grateful that uh, Kim shared that map that, uh, that McDermott shared with us. And um, that's about... I could tell some other stories about that cliff. Uh, one time a mysterious uh, dummy was hung off of that other cliff with that end. And uh, everybody wondered wh what that dummy was doing hanging on that cliff up there. But I have no idea what that was all about. <laughs> <laughs> so any, any questions? That's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I, I would just add that. Tom's house essentially is where that we spoke of the first winter camp, Williamson winter camp, David Williamson, Mullen's future brother-in-law. That's where his camp was to construct this whole three-mile grade. And there are not very many places right now where you can walk on the original footprint of the Mullen Road. And uh, for do I don't think it's three miles. <laughs> it's probably closer to two and a half. Um, is it three miles? Um, the big side cut out by um, above Alberton Gorge is is one of the other places in Montana, at least that that you can actually walk on it. But um, this is pretty unique, pretty special for our for our community to me. Um, Dennis, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Mostly, um, Dennis was the one who took me, who got me up on three mile grade. Dennis is knows how they made roads back then and today. <laughs> Dennis, <sing. laughs> 
Yeah, I'm Dennis Sane. Uh, trip over everything. Uh, I worked here at Bonner uh, 12 years for Anaconda, 14 years for Champion, and in the road building part of the logging operation. And Kim wanted me to talk a little bit about building these roads. Uh, the old times, uh, when we built roads, we built roads. The old timers, when they built roads, they built roads as well. But it was pick and shovel, wheelbarrows. People don't realize wheelbarrow, smaller than a lot of the wheelbarrows we use today, to fill that, haul a rock, and dump it over the bank and build a road. And in the steeper ground, what they would do is build a trail where they get a horse or a mule up there, and they had what they called a trail plow. And they could angle it kind of one way and build a little bench. Then they could get up on there with their slips, which were called uh, Fresno scrapers. Uh, but a Fresno scraper and a slip are two different things, but they're normally lumped in the same category. A Fresno scraper had wheels that you could dig the dirt up and haul it, and a Fresno or a slip just had two handles, and the guy wrapped the reins and the horse around his back and held on the handles and hope it didn't flip him over. And they would drag their dirt, and a, a slip would probably haul maybe a yard of dirt at a time. So you're looking at slow progress, a lot of hand shoveling and where they couldn't get the horses. Uh, when they run into rock, uh, Rock was a real problem back then. Uh, if they could blast it, uh, and they were using black powder back in the 1860s. Uh, dynamite had not really come in to real existence until later. Uh, they would take the, the black powder and they would lay it up on a crack in a spot in a rock and pile mud on top of it in what they called a plaster. And they would set that off and blow up the rock as best they could and roll the rest of it off with picks and shovels and pry bars. When the rock got too hard, then they had to drill it. Well, they didn't have uh, pneumatic drills, so one man is holding the steel, and the other guy's got about a 16-pound hammer beating on the end of that steel, and he hopes that the hammer guy doesn't miss because he has to keep rotating that steel every time he hits that steel, and the, the steel man has to give it a little twist so it bores a hole in the rock. Well, then they would fill that hole with the black powder and, and blow the rock out of the way. And then it's more handwork of, of dragging a rock and rolling it over the bank. And, and like that three-mile grade, which uh, is about, uh, well, three miles, that's about 15,000 feet. And, uh, and Jared Hirsch, here, him, him and I were dozer operators for years, and we looked at uh, 15,000 feet, uh, even with our little D7s, uh, that 15,000 feet would probably take us about seven, eight days to build, even with the rock, and considering the months that they used. And when they got into flatter ground, they could use wagons to haul their dirt to make fills, and, and these wagons uh, might haul two or three yards of dirt, where now a modern scraper nowadays, even the smaller ones are 13 yards, and up to 50, 60 yards on these scrapers. And the scrapers now travel 20, 30 mile an hour, where a team and a horse hauling, hauling three, four yards is a real slow process. So these guys, they were determined. Uh, some places, uh, I don't see them here. Other places, the rock work that these people have done building these roads, the retaining walls that they built are a piece of art in itself. There's several of them in this area. There's some up in Gold Creek where the horse loggers were logging off of Sunflower Mountain. They, they built a beautiful set of retaining wall rock, uh, retaining walls that uh, when the company, when we were building road in there, we talked them into jacking the road grade up rather than destroy all that and raise the road grade up and dumped all of our waste onto the road so we've saved them retaining walls. You gotta walk in there to see them now but they are a piece of art and you gotta give your hands off to these guys that 
that built these roads, I mean, uh, you think about it, a wheelbarrow. You're hauling that dirt, a wheelbarrow load at a time and dumping it over the bank. And you've got a crew of about 20, 30 guys doing this where nowadays uh, on the company when we built road, we had two right-of-way sawyers, had a pioneer cat skidding and decking logs and a dozer operator, so a four-man crew. And we were building uh, 1,200 to 1,500 feet a day. So uh, there is a real change in techniques. Yeah, that's about all I got, Kim. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I, you may be. You are you going to talk about retaining walls, or? Well, I could mention. Okay, that I was hoping you would, because the, there's one pretty cool one out west of town. Right. Yeah, for for the most part, on the stuff I've seen you know, out west of Alberton, where there's a fairly significant stretch that has portions of the road that was constructed under Mullen's supervision and then a lot of reroute routes that were constructed during the Milwaukee. And so I think that the, the retaining walls there were primarily done by the Milwaukee uh, because at, at that point what they're trying to do is eliminate crossings. They, you know, the Milwaukee comes through there and they cut off the, the, the wagon road and so they would reroute the wagon road. Well, the original route was was the simplest route that you could get through to get a wagon, but they had to turn around, and I've seen spots to where they've got uh, probably 15 to 20 foot deep cuts through solid rock, and so, and then they would come out uh, out out of that, and they might have a have a fill that's 10 to 15 feet deep, and along the edges of those fills, they'd have beautiful retaining walls. And then for drainages off times, what they did is they, they didn't have pipe at that time, so they would put big rock in the bottom of the draw and then downsize their rock as they came up to where basically it was a macadam type of road. Question? Something else. Question. Um, <coughs> west of Alberton, uh, you know where that, that rock pier bridge is? Yeah. I think it's at Alberton. Or just west of Albert. And then road, the old road must have crossed on the south side of the, of the river. And somewhere in there you see quite a bit of rock work down fairly close to the, the river and then there, there's no railroad grade above it. Is that some of that stuff you're talking about or is that some other? No, that's a completely different phase of something. That I, what you're talking is what they call the natural pier bridge. You know, and it's it's a much later aspect of it. Like, you know, Kim said earlier, everything, they, they were on the north side of the river all the way from, uh, they crossed at St. Regis, and then they stayed on the north side of the river all the way to Medicine Tree Hill. Or, well, initially they had all these little crossings between here, but after, in 62, 63, they did that. The retaining walls you can see still, that's on the south side of the road. Right, yeah, I just see Near the tunnel at mile post 157 on the Northern Pacific. Well, the grades above these, these rock walls, can you see them? I, I, I'm just curious where, what they were so. You know, Dusty, in, in a lot of these things, what you've got to look at is, is in any of these areas, any of these communities, you have, we, we have uh, 150 years between when the Mullen Road was built, originally constructed, or and, and I don't call it constructed. I like to refer to it as located because the only place it was physically constructed was where a wagon couldn't drive without doing some sort of earthwork or taking down some trees. If they could, you know, coming through the Missoula Valley, there wasn't a tree out there, and they just drove. Now, when they crossed a creek like the Rattlesnake, they, they very likely had to do some stuff to get the wagon down into the creek and back out of the creek. But that would be the only construction. Beyond that, they're just driving. I have a quick question, then I'd like, we're almost out of time here, but I'd like Willie Bateman to come up here for a minute, or I'll bring this to you. Um, how, many people, uh, how many people here live within a mile of the Mullen Road? That's what I was thinking. It's, it's, it's a pretty important route and corridor um, to Missoula and to Bonner. 
Willie, this is Willie has some things to say about Three Mile Grade, I believe. This is Willie Bateman. I'm not much of a orator or a speaker, but uh, this one section of the it's a mic up like a ice cream cone. <laughs> that uh, that one section up in there, my mother. When she come here from Indiana in 1906, and uh, why coming from Indiana they settled up way up on the head of the rattlesnake, up what was later to become the Franklin Ranger Station, and they were up there for quite a long time, then moved down to the east side. Well, anyway, the first ones that they got acquainted with was uh, a fellow by the name of Harry Morgan. Uh, maybe some of the old timers might remember the name. He was a game warden up around Ovando for many, many years. Well, anyway, they would take uh, wagons, go on fishing trips up into Rock Creek. Well, anyway, this was before the highway come through, and the only thing up and down the valley then was the railroad. Well, anyway, when they would get at the foot of the the grade up there, what is known as the Three Mile Grade, uh, her mom, which which was my grandmother, they were scared of the mountains, so they would get off the wagons. And they'd walk the full length of that three-mile grade from just below in there where Tommy Ewell lives all the way to Kendall Creek because they were afraid of either falling off the mountain or the mountain falling off of them, <laughs> onto them. But after a number of years, she got to traveling through there. Well, she kind of got over her fear. And anyway, when I was just a kid, she was an outdoor person and she liked to take hikes. And one of her favorite walks was to go from our place across the old bridge up there at Tura and go up on the Mullen Road and walk all the way over to Kendall Creek and then back home again. And that's one of these trips is when she told me about her and her mother getting off the wagon and walking that full length being afraid of the mountain. That uh, that one section up up above on Rocky Point, they call it, I guess it's up the other side of Rock Creek, uh, where the road comes down on the south side of the river. There was a bridge right there that they crossed, one of the crossings. And uh, at one time, you could still see those, the old bridge, bridge abutments in there. Well, it was later years I found out that right at the mouth of Bateman Creek, now I didn't know anything about Bateman Creek in those days, but I had a, a great uncle that come up here from Utah and homesteaded right there to at that bridge. Um, I, I have a friend over in Butte that's done a lot of research on the name and everything, and uh, he found in the records up at Phillipsburg where Tom Bateman had homesteaded that in 1891, and uh, he proved up on it, and uh, received a patent on it in 1895 or 96. And then he left there uh, and went, went up to Ravala, which he had the stage station and the, the uh, livery stable and the hotel up there at Ravala. Uh, and right down below my place down there, Tura, where we first moved up there in 19, 
1934, Dad went to work for an old fellow that that had the ranch there. And I didn't know it at that time, just a little kid and everything, but but that place was a, had been a stage station right there. Well, as years went by, and when the freeway started coming through, they built in there and they moved that building. The old fellow that worked at uh, Bowers of Dump, he bought it and had it moved and pushed over there in the brush and I didn't get over around there till one time the guy that bought that ranch up there got in there with a backhoe and he knocked it all down. Well anyway, the original structure was all hand-hewed logs, dovetail logs. Well, I went down there on a walk one day and I got to looking through some of the the old rubbish and stuff in there and I found on the walls had been had been papered with newspapers and I managed to get a few chunks off there and brought it home and soaked it overnight in water and everything and separated them and uh, there's quite a few old articles in there and I wanted to go down there the next day and really go through that stuff happened to look down there one morning and seen smoke coming up went down there and this guy that had bought the ranch he had went in there and got a burning permit and burnt the whole whole darn thing up. I got one little chunk of wood out of the ho out of that whole whole station up there. But uh, yeah that Mullen Road up there had been I've been walking that for years and years and years and last summer Kim asked me if I would go up there with him and kind of show him around too. So Here, a while back, uh, I think Kim wrote an article in uh, about the stagecoach bathrooms there in Tura. Showed Willie standing down there beside him. Where's that located? Oh, well, that's right up at, uh, well, right up there where Tom U lives. Oh, it's up there on up above that little way. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's on the other side of the river, though, right? I mean, yeah, it's it's on the Tura side of the river, um, just a mile from the intersection, or so. It's in it's. Do you know Lawrence Moran? Um, it's it's in the backyard of their house, um, before you cross the bridge. Yeah, that's where when they came down from Three Mile Grade, uh, it, it it looks like that's what the, they come down and <laughs> take a rest. Isn't it that old outhouse where the picture was taken isn't exactly where it was at that time when I lived up there as a kid. It is set over on the other side, not too far from from this old old log house, which had been sided up. And then there was another addition added on to it years later. But originally had been a stage station. They had these stage, station, stage stations approximately, oh, 10, 11 mile apart. They had one at Clinton, and uh, then they had that, that one at Tura, and the next one, I don't know just where it was at, down around Missoula somewhere, and then Hellgate. Yeah, the uh, uh, yeah, those buildings up there at the oh, what's the name of the Extra, restaurant? Extrams. Extrams. Yeah, those were all moved down from New Chicago. And then there's one over across from my place, right over there at the mouth of uh, yeah, right over at the mouth of Crystal Creek. In there that was moved, uh, dismantled and brought down there and built over on the the bench over at Crystal Creek. And it come from New Chicago. So. Thank you, Willie. Willie Bateman. Um, we've overstayed our welcome. It's 10 after 4. Um, 
so I, I won't finish up with where uh, all the way up to Medicine Tree Hill, but um, I would like to mention, A, that um, there's going to be more, more Mullen Road talk this Friday. Again, Bill Weichel is going to be at the University History Club. Is that what they call it? History Group or Jim? The History Group meets in the Gallagher Business Building, room 119 at 7 p.m., the fifth Friday of this month, which happens also to be Good Friday. <laughs> The Gallagher Building, 7 p.m. Friday night. Um, there's also uh, the annual uh, Mullen Day Conference, which is coming our way now next year. Um, it's going to be in Spokane, tentatively, uh, the first weekend of May during Bloomsday weekend. Um, last year it was in Walla Walla. We're starting a pattern where it's going to work its way down the trail. So from Walla Walla to Spokane to Missoula next year where we're hoping, I'm hoping, that we can concentrate on the east um, east of Missoula, the Mullen Road east of Missoula. Um, and then, then it'll be in Helena and then it'll be in, at Fort Benton. So it travel it's going to be on a five-year cycle these are kind of fun for us Mullenite type folks um scott keen also uh, there's scott scott do you want to do you want to mention yours well um april 27th just about a month from now we're going to be running the sawmill the old steam-powered sawmill what we call forestry day out there at the fort so uh we have a full bunch of forestry stuff going on with logging competition but we'll be running the old steam-powered sawmill that day, pretty much all day. What day was that again? April 27th. It's fascinating to watch that stuff. Yeah, as soon as it's fired up, whenever that is. <laughs> and, uh, whatever. Might be after noon or before noon? Yeah, it'll probably be like 10 or 11 until yeah, 3. 10 or 11, okay. Well, if you want to come and help on the job training, we will give it to you. <laughs> I'll have the cab of the Willamette Steam Locomotive open the same day as mostly all day. The one that used to be out here in yeah. Bonner. The, the, uh, again, that's April 27th during, in conjunction with logging days, and um, it's out at the Fort, Fort Missoula at the museum. Thanks, for everybody, for coming. Appreciate it.